Hey, Biology 400 students, this is Mr. Gales. Welcome to another screencast. This is the first session for Energy and Organisms, or Thermodynamics, our new unit. Before we start our screencast, make sure that you have your two-column note sheets available and that you're ready to take down some detailed notes. Make sure that when you're doing your notes, you're identifying main ideas. Those are things that are going to be underlined usually in the presentations. Those will go on the left. On the right-hand side, you want to write down definitions, examples. You might want to do a couple drawings if it seems appropriate. And also make sure that you write down questions that you may have because that's very important when you come into class. If you're not understanding something, we need to take the time to make sure that you uh, can get some clarification. Okay, as we begin, we're going to take a look at the picture that's on the title screen here. You see energy and organisms, and we see this great picture of the bear eating the fish. This is a great picture because the bear is obviously very good at what it's doing. It's catching the fish right out of midair. It's great. But why is that important? Why do we care as biology students? Well, think about what the bear is actually doing. The bear is eating, and by eating, it's consuming all of the organic molecules that make up that fish, that fish's body. In our last unit, we learned about carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. When that bear is eating that fish, it's consuming all of those different kinds of organic molecules, and it's taking in those organic molecules into its own body and making use of those. This presentation is really going to focus on uh, the aspects of energy that that bear is going to be able to take away from the fish that it consumes. All right, so let's move forward a little bit here. Um, when we're looking at uh, the, the main idea of this first screencast, we're really thinking about energy and nutrients. Energy is going to be a sort of a major theme throughout this unit, obviously, but really we're, today we're going to define what energy is. Energy can be defined as the capacity to do work or cause change. Now, we oftentimes think about when, we, when we're energetic, we feel like we can do a lot of work or we feel like we can do a lot of activity. Biologically, we might think about work uh, in a slightly different way. For a biological organism, work might include repairing damage, producing new cells, reproducing, responding to the environment. So there's lots of different kinds of work that a biological organism needs to do to maintain life. Energy is the capacity to do that work. Uh, now, there are lots of different kinds of energy. There are obviously kinetic energy. You guys are probably familiar with this term. Kinetic energy means the energy of motion. So if we have a spring that's uncoiling, that's got some kinetic energy that's in it, uh, in that movement. Or if a, a ball is a bowling ball, for instance, rolling down the, the lane, it has kinetic energy. Potential energy is just that. It has, it's, it's energy that is stored up. It has the potential to do work, but it's not doing it yet. So if you take that very same bowling ball that was rolling down the lane and you hold it six feet up in the air, it's got a lot of potential energy in it because if you were to drop it, it could do some serious work on your foot. I mean, it could make it really hurt. You wouldn't want to do that. Other types of energy we're familiar with, thermal energy, uh, what we usually refer to as heat. Chemical energy is really probably going to be the one that we're going to talk about the most here today. Chemical energy is the energy that's stored up in, in chemical bonds. So let's switch. To, let's move along to that next main idea. Uh, our next main idea in this presentation is chemical energy, and that's the energy stored in organic molecules. And what we're really talking about here when we're talking about chemical energy is the energy that is stored up in, for instance, something like a carbohydrate or a lipid. Uh, if we take a look at the picture that's coming up on the screen right now, this is a picture of a log burning. That log is composed primarily of complex carbohydrates like cellulose, very highly ordered polysaccharides. So what happens is as that log burns, the chemical bonds that are holding that cellulose together are being broken apart and the energy that was storing uh, or, or that was holding the, the atoms together is released. Um, any type of bond has energy in it, but particularly bonds that hold together atoms and organic molecules. If we look at this picture here, we're going to see, I'm going to go forward one more time here. If we look at the picture here, we're going to see that there are a lot, there's a lot of energy stored up in, for instance, carbon to oxygen bonds or hydrogen to oxygen bonds, carbon to hydrogen bonds, and then also here carbon to carbon bonds. These are, of course, the kinds of bonds that are going to be most common in organic molecules. Lots of energy stored there. Now, that energy, like the energy that was stored up in the molecules that made up that fish, the bears eating the fish, that energy has to be released somehow. So the, the chemical energy, you can think of it as potential energy. It's energy that's stored up in those molecules, but it needs to be released in order for it to be able to do work. The next main idea talks about that kind of energy. Free energy is the portion of energy that's released during chemical reactions that's available to do work. 
So when a molecule, one of these organic molecules down here, when this molecule is going to be broken apart during a chemical reaction, the, the bonds that are there will, will be broken, the energy is going to be released, and that energy is then available to do work. Uh, an example of cellular work that's going to be very common that we'll study later in the semester is, is the movement of materials across the cell membrane. This particular picture is showing here the movement of hydrogen ions across the cell membrane from what we would call an area of lower concentration where there are fewer of them on the left to an area of higher concentration on the right where there are more of them. This type of transport is called active transport and it requires energy. You can see here, something we'll allude to a little bit later, the energy molecule at play is called ATP. This is essentially the cell's free energy currency, so to speak. All right, um, in terms of energy and nutrients, we really want to think about how organisms go about obtaining their energy. There's two major what we would refer to as lifestyles, I guess, when we talk about organisms and how they get their energy, and that's autotrophy or heterotrophy. Now, autotrophs, are organisms capable of producing their own food? That's a pretty good trick. Um, generally, when we talk about autotrophs, we're thinking about plants, but they also include organisms like algae and bacteria. Some, some bacteria are capable of doing photosynthesis as well. Autotroph <coughs> comes from the Greek word troph, trophikos, which means to eat, and auto means self. So this is a self-feeding, self-eating, self-feeding organism. Organisms that make their own food. Now, the other kind of lifestyle in terms of obtaining energy is called heterotrophy or heterotrophs. Heterotrophs are organisms that have to obtain food from an outside source and generally they do that by consuming another organism. So the picture that we see here, we've got an apple tree. That apple tree is doing photosynthesis. It's producing its own food in the form of carbohydrates. Any of the excess uh, carbohydrate that's produced is stored up in fruit. Now fruit is a really handy reproductive uh, tool. What plants do is they store their seeds inside this fruit. Fruit is a, a, a obviously a, a great food source for other animals, so other animals will come along and eat that fruit. They consume the seed with the fruit and then they walk away and later on they um, pass those seeds through their digestive system and that's how the plant's able to spread and reproduce. So autotrophs and heterotrophs. Now, when we think about autotrophs and heterotrophs in the context of biology, we need to understand that there are some very important chemical reactions that are at play that make life possible that happen there. Autotrophs obviously are doing photosynthesis, this reaction which takes in sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water and produces those carbohydrates. Um, that's the food production part. Now that is the production of chemical energy, of potential chemical energy stored up in organic compounds. In order for that energy to be used, it's going to have to be released from those organic molecules. And the reaction that is at play there is called cellular respiration. There's kind of a misconception that plants and autotrophs do photosynthesis and animals do cellular respiration, and that's wrong. Remember, every organism is going to need to have energy made available to it. So what will happen is, yes, autotrophs are the ones that exclusively do photosynthesis and make their own food. But all cells, animal cells, plant cells, bacterial cells, any kind of cell has to be involved in being able to do cellular respiration to re release that energy from the organic molecules and again make that free energy molecule that we call ATP, cellular energy currency. So heterotrophs and autotrophs are involved in cellular respiration. Now this diagram is kind of a, a, a great depiction of how autotrophs and heterotrophs uh, photosynthesis and cellular aspiration really are a complementary series of reactions. We have the ultimate source of energy on our planet is the sun, so we get light energy, it's radiant energy that comes into any ecosystem and is captured by autotrophs. Uh, the chloroplast that you're seeing here, this is the site of photosynthesis. So autotrophs will take in carbon dioxide through their leaves, for instance, if it's a plant, it'll take in water through their roots, and those substances are combined in the chloroplasts uh, and the energy from the sun is captured and stored into organic molecules. So essentially these simple substances are converted into more complex organic substances here. There's obviously a lot of stored chemical potential energy in these organic molecules. An interesting byproduct is oxygen, which is really great because we need oxygen in order to live. Now when we take in the organic molecules by eating them and we combine them with oxygen that we breathe in, those substances go into the mitochondria within our cells. Of course, that happens inside plant cells as well. The organic molecules are broken down inside the mitochondria. Um, and during that process, 
free energy is released. There's that ATP molecule again. ATP is the cellular free energy currency. The byproduct of cellular respiration is carbon dioxide and water, which coincidentally is the raw materials necessary for photosynthesis. So you can see there's a, a cyclical relationship between photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Uh, it's one kind of interesting thing to think about is plants uh, really have the, the, the best situation because they can make their own food and they can also break that food down the, the, and release the, the energy from the chemical energy. Heterotrophs, like us animals, rely on plants. We rely on plants as a producer of usable energy for us, producer of food, and we also rely on plants, obviously, for a source of oxygen. Uh, the diagram that you're seeing here is called a food web. A food web depicts the flow of energy through an ecosystem. So here we see it down at the bottom are the primary producers. These are the autotrophs, plants, algae, and bacteria that take in sunlight and convert that sunlight into a usable form of energy. It's referred to as chemical energy here. And then along every layer here or every level of the food web, we have different kinds of consumers. Primary consumers are usually organisms that consume only the plant material. Those would be referred to as herbivores. You've got secondary consumers which eat the herbivores. Those are the lower level carnivores. And then we have the higher level carnivores called tertiary consumers, like this owl here. Now all organisms will eventually die and the material that makes up their body and their wastes uh, would, is all essentially gonna be consumed by what we call the detrophores or the detritivores. These are the decomposers like bacteria and fungus and some certain animals, crayfish for instance, might feed this. And they uh, obtain their chemical energy from the decaying uh, bodies and wastes of all other organisms. All right, we have two final ideas in this screencast. We're going to look at energy flow and conversions, and the, we're going to begin with our next main idea, which is the law of conservation of energy. This is also referred to as the first law of thermodynamics, but it's probably familiar to you because if you remember from biochemistry, we learned about the law of conservation of matter. The law of conservation of energy states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can change form. So if you consider what we talked about with the law of conservation of matter, you can have matter go through a chemical reaction, it's not created or destroyed in that chemical reaction, but it changes form. The same thing happens with energy. Energy is not created or destroyed, but it can change form from, for instance, radiant energy, sunlight, right, light energy, into chemical energy by photosynthesis. Now why is this important? It tells us that the total energy of the universe is constant, and because of that, no new energy is being created. Now ultimately, as a biology student, the reason that you need to know this is that you need to understand that organisms cannot create their own energy. They have to obtain it from an outside source. Again, there's a kind of a misconception that when we look at a plant, like we see here, this aspect of photosynthesis, a lot of students have the misconception that plants are making their own energy. They're making their own food. They're taking one form of energy, light energy, and converting it into chemical energy. Right? So they take in sunlight, along with carbon dioxide and water, and they convert that into carbohydrate glucose. Uh, similarly, if we think about heterotrophs, this is sort of the classic heterotroph image of the predator and the prey. This cheetah can't make its own energy. It has to obtain it from an outside source. So what it's doing is it's hunting down the gazelle. And as it consumes the gazelle's body, it's taking in the organic molecules that built that gazelle's body. And those organic molecules will eventually be broken down and the chemical energy will be re released so the cheetah's body can do work. Okay. The final main idea for this first screencast in thermodynamics is the second law of thermodynamics. This law states that there's a natural tendency towards disorder, or what we call entropy, in any system. Um, now entropy, in order for you to understand this, I'm going to give you an example that I think you can relate to. Um, if you consider your, think about your own bedroom at home, and you work really hard to get it nice and clean. You've got everything put away where it belongs. The clothes are all hung up. They're put into the drawers where they belong. You've got your books on the shelves. Everything's in order. The bed's made. There's no empty you know, cups or there's no plates all over the floor. It looks good. Now, what happens if you completely ignore it for the rest of the week? You don't do any work in keeping it clean. You know what happens. It gets really messy. Um, what Essentially, what's being described here is that there's a tendency towards disorder, and we see this in our own lives. If we don't take the time to maintain, for instance, our rooms or our houses, they get, they get messy, they get disordered. Um, we know that energy is required to keep our, our 
rooms or our, home, our house is in order. And so we can generalize and say that energy is required to resist entropy. Now here's another example of an entropy type uh, situation. This log, this is the same picture we saw a little bit earlier, this log as a log is highly organized organic material. It's uh, layer after layer of cellulose. So it's in, in a, a greater state of order. As the log burns, it's increasing in its entropy. There's less and less order as the log burns. Okay, so that's another example of entropy. Now why is this important for biology students to know about? Organisms have to be well organized to remain alive and grow, and organization requires energy. We have to have a constant input of energy, and if that input of energy ceases, then our cells and our systems simply fall apart. They go towards disorder. An example of this would be the picture that we see here. We've got down here in the lower corner a cell, which is a highly ordered structure inside an organism. That cell contains DNA in the form of chromosomes, again a highly organized structure. And in order for a cell to grow, or for an organism to grow, it needs to be able to divide its cells. So this requires energy. It's simply that in order to maintain the organization and in order for this process to occur. So the second law of thermodynamics really is a justification for why we need to consume food, why we need a source of energy. And the first law of thermodynamics really explains how we get our energy. Autotrophs are able to make their own food, right? So they have their own source of energy built in. They, they can convert it from one energy form to another. And heterotrophs need to take in food from a, a different source, okay? So these two laws really are critical because they help us to understand why energy is so important in living things. All right, if you have any questions, make sure that you've got them recorded in your notes. Mr. Workman is gonna talk to you next about cellular reactions, chemical reactions that occur in cells, and we're going to look at two major types of reactions, which are called exothermic and endothermic reactions. Until next time, this is Mr. Gales signing off, and I'll see you in biology.